Welcome to Independent Truths with Scott Atlas, my show that brings a hopefully rational perspective to sort out some of the most complicated and controversial issues of the day. Today's guest is Professor Todd Zwicky of the George Mason University Antonin Scalia School of Law. Todd and I will have a fascinating conversation about one of the most complicated issues facing America and culture today, wokeism. What is wokeism and what do we do about it? Thanks for joining us and stay tuned. Today's guest is Professor Todd Zwicky of the George Mason University Antonin Scalia School of Law. He's a research fellow of the Law and Economics Center and former executive director of the GMU Law and Economics Center. Uh, he has so many uh, very impressive titles and jobs. Uh, in 2021, he served as the chair of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Task Force on federal consumer financial law. He is a renowned teacher and scholar in several areas, including bankruptcy, contracts, commercial law, law and economics, public choice in the law. He clerked for Judge Jerry Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Todd is a stellar graduate of the law school from the University of Virginia, where he was the executive editor of the Virginia Tax Review and the John Olin Scholar in Law and Economics, received his master's in economics from Clemson, and a bachelor's degree cum laude with high honors from Dartmouth College. Uh, he's the author of more than 130 articles in leading law reviews, one of the most top 50 most downloaded law authors at the Social Science Research Network all time, and uh, is uh, really a very outstanding articulator of very complex issues. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Todd back to the podcast. Todd, welcome. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be back with you. So many things, again, to talk about because uh, the world uh, doesn't seem to be simplifying. It's a <laughs> lot more complexity happening every day. Today, uh, I would like to talk about this very sort of strange topic that is beginning to impact all parts of American life, increasingly all of our institutions, whether it's universities, the government, the military, the private sector, uh, simply K through 12 schools. And that is this issue that is referred to as wokeism. So let's let's start with this because this is a uh, of course it's now uh, it's also coming to the fore in the election cycle. Can you define the term? What is woke? What is wokeism? Sure, and and this is a uh, um, ob obviously something that started in the universities to some extent, but didn't remain in the universities, which tells us a lot about the influence that university ideas have on society um, in sort of shaping future generations. Um, and wokeism is an idea that um, basically the, the term comes from the concept that there is an underlying um, order to the world that is not usually observed. There's a sort of uh, under, there's a superstructure and a substructure of power relationships, historical relationships, institutional dynamics that people take for granted, sort of like the uh, proverbial um, goldfish swimming in the uh, fish bowl who's not aware of um, the water that they're swimming in. Uh, and the idea here is, is that what woke claims to do is awaken uh, people to this underlying fabric of society, this underlying structure of uh, power relationships uh, and the like, with the idea being that once you're awakened, you can do something about it. It's kind of uh, reminiscent of the old Marxian idea of um, of uh, false consciousness, uh, but in some sense, it's much uh, deeper rooted and more pernicious than the Marxist uh, saw it as. So, uh, what what about this concept? Uh, it, it's a it's an entire world concept to me. It's not it's not just cultural. It's really redefining uh, truth, but in a funny way, it's it's defining the absence of truth. It's it's uh, it's sort of saying, by definition, 
everything that you think is wrong because <laughs> that's what you think is right. It, it's it's sort of a to me a very strange circular logic based upon complete upheaval. I mean, I don't know how to even articulate it that well, and that's one of the reasons you're but, here. What 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 is the logical structure? What is the logic? How does the logic flow? in people who believe in this. Right, and that that's right, Scott, which is, um, you know, one of the reasons I got interested in this is those of us on our side, I think, kind of look at this as kind of a silly faddish um, sort of thing, perhaps. Um, it's just kind of goofy and doesn't have a lot of intellectual heft. Or we just look at it as a close cousin of Marxism. And so basically the idea is, is well, nobody believes in Marxism anymore, so maybe this is just a bubble that's going to exhaust itself. But I think it's actually much deeper, and it's a much more formidable and dangerous set of uh, intellectual ideas than we have previously acknowledged, uh, which is to say, if you take everything that people like you and I and you know a lot of our listeners believe in, which is we believe in the free society, we believe in the rule of law, we believe in individual liberty, we believe in rationality and uh, reason and uh, the like, you take everything we believe, it's sort of an integrated logical structure. But if you were to take that and flip it all on its head, it would also be a logical integrated structure that rests on certain pillars, certain uh, fundamental ideas. And then it's kind of one of these things, you buy the premise, you buy the bit. And what I think makes this so dangerous, and we could talk more about this, or such a formidable and threatening intellectual idea is that there that it does rest on certain grains of truth, right? Marxism was just silly, right? Because Marxism postulated this imaginary economic world where we're going to get rid of scarcity and, you know, central planning would work. This um, this set of things is kind of much slipperier and trickier. It, it does point to certain uh, realities of the world, uh, which it then extends too far. Uh, but I think that gives a lot of sort of the credence um, uh, uh, to it that uh, that we need to, to understand the argument and why it is so compelling to so many, especially for kids. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, what I'm trying to grapple with here is that, first of all, you're being awakened, they are claiming, the people that believe in this, that all accepted truths, right. definitions or, or truths, uh, are false because, by definition, that is the accepted truth. And I, I guess what I'm getting at here uh, is that you're being awakened to a, that everything you believe in is false, right. but the only explanation of its falsity is that because that's why, because that's what you believe. <laughs> and so uh, right. it's very, it's very <laughs> difficult to argue with that because the premise is the is the basis of the conclusion the conclusion is is simply circling back on the premise so i'm not i'm not sure how it stands up well you say there's a there's some grain of truth uh i mean what do you mean you mean that there's a grain of truth and simply that yes there's an asymmetry of power in society yes there right. are historical uh, wrongs that were committed uh, but I think this is far more deeper right. than just simply correcting historical wrongs. I, I agree. This is fundamentally an attack on enlightenment, uh, on the enlightenment project and the idea of sort of constitutional liberal democracy. But maybe I can just summarize. There's really kind of three premises, three pillars that underlies this. And we can kind of see how, as soon as we kind of understand this, a lot of the things that seem very puzzling to us fall into place. So, um, so the first one is the idea that uh, um, that um, um, that hierarchies or social hierarchies are largely arbitrary um, and that they are um, corrupt and reflect power imbalances and not um, competition, uh, not uh, sort of competence and merit. And so this is a sense in which I say there's obviously a grain of truth here, uh, which is that having family connections, for example, being wealthier is more likely to help you to, to get ahead in life if you're a kid or something like that, right? Uh, um, right. Uh, you know, Hunter Biden was not chosen for the board of Burisma because he was obviously the most qualified oil and gas uh, consultant uh, in the world, right? So it's obvious that there's some aspect of this. And so the idea they take there is, is that that just means that all forms of merit, um, and so there's obviously some truth there, and there's historical discrimination like, 
But I think from that, all forms of merit are completely uh, arbitrary. So in this worldview, for example, being a minority, for example, uh, is just as good of a qualification as to be on the board of a semiconductor company as having 20 years of experience in the industry. Why? Uh, because the white male who was able to start a semiconductor company um, just had an opportunity that, let's say, the minority did. And so in that sense, it's arbitrary to say one has uh, a more uh, is more qualified than, than the other. Uh, the second idea that goes with this, that now we're starting to move in on the, the, this idea of truth, is that formal rules of processes and procedures, such as the rule of law, neutral rules of free speech, for example, that everybody can speak, uh, constitutional rules, um, fairness rules, all those sorts of things, those are, they appear to be neutral, but they are not because they inherently reinforce the existing power imbalance in society. So to get to, to your point, why, uh, um, why, why is free speech not useful to them in this way? Well, because what they say is that, uh, that those who are privileged, like you and I, right, people who are educated, uh, who are trained, who have uh, advantages, um, we are just better at that game than people who are not, right? And so we write the rules as to what counts as evidence of truth. So empirical truth, for example, data analysis, logical argumentation. And their view is, well, that's just completely arbitrary. You guys just choose those because that's what you're good at. Why couldn't lived experience, for example, or are my personal narrative not be equally as valid as, as yours? Um, because I feel like those are, are, are equally valid, right? And so then you get to the bottom line here, which is the point that you're getting at, which is truth itself. And this is sort of the, 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 sort of the final underpinning of this, which is they believe that people are not rational, autonomous thinkers. Uh, we're not able to, you said that we're not responsible for our own actions and beliefs, but we are um, fundamentally shaped by our environments, our identities, and that sort of thing. And so we are enculturated into this idea that there are certain truths, um, but there, but we just take it for granted in some sense. We're culturated into this idea that there are certain types of arguments that count as logical arguments as opposed to um, to, to others. But they say, but they say, why? They say basically everybody's experience is different. There is no one truth. Um, there are just truths. There's your truth. There's my truth. There's Barack Obama's truth, right? Uh, there's every, all these different truths where people see the world through different sorts of, uh, sorts of things. And so to say that there is a truth um, and that we can actually reason to it, that we can dialogue, about, that through the exchange of conversation and presenting evidence and that sort of thing, we can approximate truth, they say that's just fundamentally flawed. Right. And so this is a sense in which this is an attack on the Enlightenment and democracy, uh, which is to accept the rules of free speech, for example, is to accept the rules of the powerful. Um, and so what they say is um, that's just power. That's not reason. That's not evidence. It's just power saying this counts and that doesn't. Um, and this is where it gets kind of scary, Scott, which is now we get the bottom line, which is this bizarre idea that speech is violence that just seems so bizarre to us. But well, if you think about it in their worldview, speech that reinforces the status quo, right? Speech that upholds the existing power structure um, is speech that essentially um, supports violence against people who are of a lower power and lower status uh, in, in society. And so in their view, um, that is a form of violence. Um, and so they're justified in using violence um, in response. And so this is how you can start off with some basic ideas. Yeah, there's uh, inequality in the world. There are historical injustices in the world that uh, that people are, you know, have some, are shaped to some extent by their environment. And you end up in a very dramatically weird and scary and anti-liberal place. Yeah, I, I think that all the arguments are, I think, fairly easy to refute. And given that I'm not very sophisticated <laughs> in the topic, I, mean, I find it even easier because... Uh, you know, I think some of the stuff is absurd. I mean, first of all, to because the, the first argument, merit is a false uh, sort of concept. Uh, be, and the, the evidence of saying that seems to be that because there are unfair situations, because 
people rise to the top at times that have no merit. Right. Uh, let's just make that as a as a as an assumption that there is a whether you want to call it an old boys network. We've all seen it. We we work at these elite universities. I'm probably the only faculty member that I personally know that have parents who didn't go to college. I mean, there's certainly a lot of truth to the fact that it's harder, <laughs> right? Certainly more difficult to to rise up uh, in a power structure. But because uh, there are exceptions to merit, even if there are many, many exceptions to merit-based achievement, to me, like it's this logical fallacy of this reductio ad absurdum that therefore there is no right. such thing as merit. It's taking an extreme position uh, that that is that's you know that that doesn't uh, that doesn't hold up. I mean, the second one, you know, if I'm uh, if I wrote this down here, freedom. Uh, rules are not neutral, and therefore freedom of speech uh, uh, shouldn't be uh, even pursued because somebody else defined freedom of speech. I mean, to me, that's uh, like circling back on causing the people who believe in that, that wokeism, to repress their own speech. I mean, the argument is turnable against them. And so I, it just doesn't even make it to me. That's nonsensical, completely illogical. And the third one, truth itself is really false. Um, there is no such thing as truth. There is no such thing as fact. There is no such thing as evidence. Uh, I'm not sure what the alternative right. world is that they're going for. Pure chaos, pure random noise. <laughs> uh, I don't. I, I don't I think it in in a in a very fundamental way to me it sounds like uh, a a young immature child making these arguments. It's sort of like when you have a little kid uh just like going for, in an illogical way from point A to point B and just demanding things. Uh to me there's there's no fundamental logic to what they're saying even though there is a a a shred of something that they could base this on. And so I think that there's a, you know, this to me points out something that I find, uh, again, it was exposed in COVID. We've known it exist, existed forever, which is there are very few people who are critical thinkers. And this is an example of people uh, who are not really critically thinking about this stuff. When I'm saying people, I'm talking about the people we see that are the younger generation joining in on this nonsensical uh, sort of construct. Uh, and they're particularly young people who have never worked for a living, people who have not had any life experience that they demand be the construction of basis of everything, the so-called lived experience, but they have no lived experience, uh, ironically. Uh, and, you know, people that are in college, I, I always say, you know, they're in this bubble. Uh, they don't have to work. They're in this, now it's the most sheltered environment in the country, being on a college campus for a student. And so I sort of want to get to the next question to you, which is, uh, you can expand or simply say I was wrong, but why is it so appealing to young people here? Because in our era, you know, I grew up, I was a little too young for the 60s revolution, but I was around. Uh, I was a kid watching. But in my era, younger generation, people were protesting against war. They were protesting against Vietnam. Uh, they were protesting. Yeah, people were dying. Uh, the war was arguable, uh, certainly in terms of its uh, rationale and morality. Uh, and they were arguing for saving people's lives uh, for their country, even though there was a tremendous amount of anti-Americanism at the time. And that's one common theme we see here is anti-Americanism. Uh, but I just wonder uh, how, how young people uh, why are they so attracted to this? Is it that we've lived in too much peace and prosperity their whole lives, or they have no familiarity with things like uh, the USSR and censorship and propaganda? What What is this? Uh, why are they so uh, easily persuadable into this? And and I think that's the right question, Scott. Right. And so what I've been trying to do for those of us on our side is so um, to to get to that question, which is obviously. These ideas have spread. These ideas have spread even beyond sort of uh, young people. They've taken over 
So we talked about early corporations, uh, K through 12 schooling, universities, right? So grownups have adopted these these also. And so my first task with kind of the deep dive and, and the military and the military the recently, I, yeah. And so I think the first thing that I've been trying to do is just try to figure out um, what uh, what what this is all about and try to get to this question of why it's uh, it, it's so appealing and sort of unpack the logical structure of it. And as you said, you know, the second stage would be well, here's everything that's wrong with it, right? So there are some things that are obviously wrong. So take, for example, the idea of there being, you know, sort of hierarchies are corrupt, they're being privileged. It's like, well, why do we just arbitrate? There's all kinds of forms of privilege and inequality and all that sort of thing in life, right? Which is why do we just focus on these ones, race, sex, or whatever? Why not the fact that, you know, tall men make more money than short men, right? Why not focus on the fact the university professors um, studiously ignore the idea that being higher in intelligence makes you privileged compared to others. Right? That's completely merited uh, as far as the professors are concerned, right? So there's all kinds of these things, and it's just arbitrary to pick which is uh, which counts um, and uh, in, in which uh, in which uh, doesn't. Um, and so, um, but I think that's, but I think you're getting to, and, and I'm and I'm tempted to say, and I think you put your finger on, it, I'm tempted to say. That a lot of what's going on here by a lot of these progressives is little more than just projection, right? Uh, which is that they are from privileged backgrounds. They have gotten, uh, you know, their daddies made the right donation to Harvard so they could get into uh, to school or whatever the case may be. And so they just assume that's the way the, way the world works. But it has real world implications. I'll give you an example. There was a study done by Cato a few years ago where they asked, how do people get rich in America? This was in 2019. And among progressives, and especially among young progressives, the three leading answers they gave of how people succeed in America are connections, inheritance, and luck. Um, and if you believe that people get ahead through connections, inheritance, luck, whatever you are, you are not going to be a capitalist, right? Um, if that's how you believe that, uh, that, that wealth is made. So there's some way in which this is speaking to, uh, to, these, uh, to these, these people, is you also suggested the most privileged people are the ones who are have been most eager to glom onto this Ivy League professors uh, and people like that, people who have succeeded uh, uh, and the like. And I think there's some interesting things uh, to be said uh, uh, about that. Um, and they are now actually, as you said, the most powerful uh, people around. And so I think there's a lot of anomalies here. But I think that there's obviously some way in which this is speaking to something in the um, psyche of uh, of people today, especially in kids today, uh, that this is feeling some need for them that we don't fully understand, but is obviously some sort of powerful need that I, th that I think is worth us exploring and trying to, because I think that's what's driving a lot of this, that willingness to buy Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't, you can't ignore it because uh, A, it's, it's, to me, uh, very harmful to achieving success on both an individual basis uh, and a societal basis. It's extremely harmful, in my view, uh, for people who don't come from pri privileged backgrounds who profess that, uh, that the system is completely rigged and you can't succeed. And you know some of this stuff is is just simply empirically provably wrong. For instance, there's some very good data on income mobility. When people talk the lowest quintile or the lowest, uh, you know, twenty percent of income uh, is is more far is farther away from the top twenty percent. Uh, they don't then look at the real question, which is that there are different people in these quintiles on a on a you know, three to five year basis that it, America has the biggest income mobility of anywhere. That's what counts uh, to me. Uh, it, you know, that's why millions of people come here. If you ask immigrants, and this is something I want to get into, uh, but that's that's why they came here for for opportunity that is unparalleled. Uh, and so this idea that because there are people who get ahead without having to work because of connections. Uh, you know, that there's there's no doubt that's partly true. In fact, you have to wonder why people keep reelecting families of of the powerful. We've had it uh, 
you know, this is a country that broke away from that uh, in its founding, and then we keep electing the Bushes and the Kennedys uh, and these wealthy families that have lineages like that. And of course, uh, being an outsider myself, uh, I'm opposed to that. Uh, and so uh, that, that's sort of an interesting uh, comment on societies that, but, you know, I wonder this, and that is the, the woke crowd, uh, they want to achieve things. They have a goal, many goals. Uh, the number one is to simply, to me, it's almost an anarchy type of goal. I'm not sure what the construct is of what they want, but we know they want to tear down everything that is uh, simply because it is. Because by definition, by definition, by their definition, anything that is, is wrong. Uh, and so, but is there a legal basis, since you're a, a constitutional scholar, of what they want to achieve? Because tactically, to me, what we see is an effort to limit freedom, an effort of cancellation of free speech, of cancel culture, of intimidation of the private corporate world, uh, of changing uh, investments from, you know, shareholder capitalism to somehow it's a stakeholder world. Uh, uh, and, and actually, even things like overt harassment, uh, character assassination, et cetera. Uh, so there's, a, there's, to me, a, a fascistic side of this wokeism. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, how are they able to get away with it? What is the legal basis? And why does it seem, as somebody who's naive to the law like I am, why does it seem that the laws seem to be broken without, uh, by that sort of effort without any repercussions? Yeah, I think, uh, let me just break that into uh, your fascinating comments. Let me just break it into two basic ideas to, to address, which is the first is you kind of made a point about the kind of radical nature of this and what it means, which I want to talk about. And then I'll talk specifically about law. But let's talk about okay. the, the, the first point because, um, uh, because it's, it's really important to understand that this really does threaten everything about the free society. Right, which is so. Take for example, free speech. Um, this is a is a classic uh, way of thinking about this uh, um, in the um, uh, in the like. Right, this goes back to this Herbert Marcuse, the idea of repressive tolerance, where he says in order to uh, have free speech, you've got to repress speech by the powerful. Now, how does this relate to the larger picture? Well, take the free speech of universities, for example. Universities rest on the idea that we have free speech because through the process of speech, debate, and dialogue, um, bad ideas are driven out, then we can search better for the truth, and that we can have a conversation, approximate truth better, um, and, um, and that sort of thing, right? But if you reject that premise, right, then you, you know, reject the premise and you reject the bit, right? And so for their view, the purpose of the university, you know, if, if you believe the purpose of the university is to seek truth, free speech is just a, an easy logical corollary of deduction. But if you believe that the purpose of the university is to um, rebalance the power structure of society, right? If you believe that there's no truth, that you believe that, um, that the purpose of the university should be liberation of the oppressed, right? Now you change your, your, your free speech rules uh, specifically, right? Basically that idea that the university exists to search for truth, you just drop that in the basket, right? In the trash can. Say, well, what does it look like? And so in that situation, what you end up doing is you have to subsume the idea of these process neutral rules, equality, due process, all these sorts of things. You subsume that to the goal of uh, equity, right? Uh, the goal of liberation. Um, and so that's where they've taken this, right? Which is we use the power balance. And so I'll give you a great example that will really resonate with you, Scott, as a, as a scientist, which is this is where it becomes very dangerous for scientific freedom. And you may be familiar, I believe Nature had this article recently about their new publication policies. In this view, scientific truth is not an abstract thing that's off here on its own. Scientific truth is embedded in a social network. So in their view, it is not it, they, they don't really care about suppressing error, right? Scientific error, like the world is flat, because that can just be rebutted by ordinary scientific terms. What they care about repressing is scientific truth. 
scientific notion truth scientific is there, no, not just the notion, but things that okay. people might think are true. So when it comes upon salient issues like sexuality, uh, race, differences between sex, it's all these different sorts of things. In their view, if you have um, findings that might be weaponized to reinforce the existing po status quo and power imbalance, that's what you have to suppress. So you may have heard about this story about this um, researcher, I believe she was a psychologist from Brown, who published a fascinating article that found during the pandemic, a whole bunch of girls who had said that they were, um, uh, uh, that they were transgender, untransitioned, detransitioned. And her hypothesis was that once they took them out of um, their social reinforcement mechanism and isolate them, they realized that they weren't transgender after all, right? Now, that could or could not be true, right? Interesting scientific question. What was fascinating about it, though, was the article was retracted on some bogus uh, claim, but really because the claim was that could be used, that could be weaponized, right? That if that were true, if people thought that were true, then that could be used to reinforce the existing power structure, right? And so this is how we start to see the certain scientific fields that get put off limits as being um, out of bounds is because they might come up with ideas that contradict the political um, uh, needs, right? Um, and so that's where right. this I creeps mean, this into a... the uh, sign repression of scientific freedom. Right. This is, yeah, it, it's almost worse. It's, it's, it, in a way, it, it, I think it's worse than repression of scientific freedom, although that is certainly part of it. It's saying that truth is dangerous. Correct. Potentially, therefore, we cannot have truth. That's right. Uh, I mean, this is really, I, I don't know uh, if this is, I, I can't imagine there's a precedent for this, really, because let, let's contrast this with the standard of Marxism, right? I mean, uh, you've pointed out to me that Marxism has a goal, an end game, uh, and, and that end game is their solution. What is the end game here for people who are in this sort of wokeism mode? The, the, what is the goal of wokeism? Is it simply nihilism? Is it simply complete anarchy and chaos? Or is there a some other system? Is it a, is it a, a reversal of the, the hierarchy to just be bottom is top, top is bottom? Or what is their goal? I asked a college student uh, I know who's very versed in this, and because I was trying to figure that out also, right? Because what ended up bringing down Marxism was to make claims about the world that turned out to be false, right? If you adopt communism, you'll be prosperous and free. And that turned out not to be true. And then basically people said, all right, the system doesn't work. Here, as you alluded to, I think it's a purely deconstructionist uh, um, agenda that can sort of uh, never end. And I think where they end up getting is to this result that you're saying is they haven't really thought about beyond the idea that the, the oppressors need to take their turn as the oppressed, right? Um, and this then is the idea kind of going back, I used the university example, but subsuming all of society to this goal of, of equity, right? Of, uh, of uh, liberation. Um, and the attack on the you know, legitimacy of the criminal justice system is a good example, right? Uh, and, right. and, you know, even university presidents uh, is a good example of ones who've jumped on this bandwagon, which is, Nowadays, what they've managed to persuade us is, or persuade a lot of people, is the only, uh, the only test of whether a criminal just a criminal trial is legitimate is if it gets the quote right to result unquote right that the police officer gets convicted right or Kyle Rittenhouse gets convicted or whatever it is right so the idea that a the fairness of a trial would be judged by whether proper procedures were followed right? Uh, whether proper rules of evidence were followed, and we accept the end result of that procedure as valid, they don't believe that anymore, right? The only thing that matters is the end result, the kind of, uh, um, you measure the, the legitimacy of the institution by the end result. And so this then allows them to use all the tools at their disposal um, and basically claim that, um, uh, that, that, you know, you can Pack the Supreme Court if you want to, right? You can get rid of the filibuster if you want to. You can do, uh, you know, you can suppress free speech if it's necessary in order to uh, reach your 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 end goal. Um, and that's where 
to the extent that the liberal democratic constitutional order rests on these sort of in academic freedom rests on these sort of process based rules of neutrality and equality, they are going directly at that. They want to destroy that, um, and they have not suggested what they're going to put in its place, other than that somehow or another it'll be some sort of more just uh, um, society, whatever that that looks like. And so there is this appeal of nihilism, of anarchism, of de- uh, uh, of uh, destruction here without any responsibility for explaining what's going to come next. Yeah. I mean, I, I also wonder, you know, this sort of brings us to the uh, what's more frightening sort of, uh, it, or another frightening end result here is that, I mean, are, are we really, are we headed, what are we headed toward here? Are, you know, are we headed toward uh, a war? Are we headed toward uh, a split country? Uh, are we, he- you know, I mean, uh, it's it's always, you know, the, the shock, the perverse logic of this is exemplified by uh, so many things, including the by the people in power, the elected officials who are pushing this sort of thing were themselves elected by the current free system. And so the logic uh that the system uh doesn't allow what they what they uh you know their success or whatever you want to call them of course is uh, on its face proven wrong by their very existence uh but uh you know how where do we where do we uh, end up here and and in that question is how of course how do we counter this uh, because you know uh this is not something that I think anyone has been able to articulate even fully to make it explainable to, to ordinary people very well. I think you do a great job of that, but it's, it's still an intellectual concept. It's not that simple. Uh, it's pervasive in the culture. And, you know, we have people who are legislators like uh, the classic sort of example would, would have to be right now Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida who has sort of a trademark of Florida where woke goes to die, which is where woke, where wokeism goes to die, and he's passing some laws. I mean, is that what is the way to stop this or to reverse this? And what is the way also, I think, because part of that is how do we educate ordinary Americans? It's not enough to say this doesn't seem right. I think it needs some clarity that is missing from the discussion. And that's what my call to people on our side is, right? Which is, and, and I appreciate you saying, because what I'm trying to do is boil this down for people uh, to um, walk away from our conversation today and say, holy crap, this is something I really do need to worry about uh, because there, there's something going on here that, uh, you know, is, is diabolically clever um, and very seductive, right? Especially for... Um, as you know, for example, there's this evidence that shows this high degree of um, mental illness, anxiety, depression among uh, progressives, right? Um, and so this destructive impulse, um, this deconstruction impulse that this feeds a need uh, in these people that then reinforces it, right? Um, uh, and, um, um, and kind of rouse them up and that sort of thing. Um, and, and you asked some really good questions and I'm still grappling to figure out. So one thing that's Kind of hard to, what I haven't been able to figure out is where exactly do these ideas come from and that how do they percolate so quickly through society? So there's a way in which ideas seem to germinate on the left. Um, I think social media plays a role in this that is different from how conservatives and libertarians think about ideas, right? Which is I can point to the guys who influenced my thinking, you know, F.A. Hayek, uh, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, you know, um, uh, Robert knows it, right? It's like, okay, I got this idea from that guy. This, guy. this just kind of emerges and it spreads in some way. And and I guarantee that the average woke person walking around has no idea who Herbert Marcuse is, right? Even though you can trace it back to, uh, to, to, to Marcuse. And so trying to understand where these ideas come from, how they germinate, um, how these ideas are being consumed, social media in some way does this. But I think the big concern for me is, is that there is no logical stopping point. There's no prudence involved in this. Because it is exactly. purely deconstructionist, there's this sort of unwinding of this internal logic um, that kind of recognizes no middle ground uh, with respect to, uh, to a lot of these things. 
Um, and that's where that seems to pick up speed over time, right? It accelerates over time as to where it's headed. And you see how quickly it spreads through the institutions. Um, and, um, uh, in, 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 and the problem is, is there can never be enough, right? We can never have the kind of perfect equality that they seek, which means it's going to have to be more and more and more and more and more repression, more and more and more suppression of ideas, speech, um, preferences, the whole nine yards, right? As they try harder and harder and harder to reach some sort of ill-defined, ill-defined goal, because there's no way they can really say at this point, we, that's enough. We've gone far enough. Well, they don't have the explicit goal because by, by articulate to me, uh, in, a, in a funny way, by articulating anything specific, they're, they're sort of uh, playing a game that they disagree with. There is no, in their view, part of this is there is no answer. So any answer, including their own, must be shot down. Uh, it, I don't know if that's I'm right. saying that correctly, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's why it's impossible to argue. It's the same problem that I always just simplify and call it circular logic. You, you can't, you can't argue against somebody who's using that, that fallacy. And there's uh, always so, you know, shifting around, right? That there's always going to be different relative degrees of oppression, right? Power is zero sum. And so there's always going to be people who are rising and falling in power. So I always give the example, it's not obvious to me, for example, how this battle would have prevailed between the rights of women to play women to play women's sports and transgender people to play women's sports, right? We've got two different people with different claims, different historical claims, all that sort of thing. Somehow or another, they knew what the answer was, right? Somehow or another, the left knew that the transgender uh, a claim trumped the, the claim of women with respect to sports. And you can sort of elaborate why that might be, but it's not obvious, right? But somehow or another, they kind of release this mind meld where they can figure out who's worthy and who's less worthy at any given time. But that's a very fluid situation that is always going to be in motion. I would guess the, the, uh, the rationale for that is because it's counter to the current accepted <laughs> model. Of that there are women sports, therefore there must not be women only sports. Right. And when there is, and pointing to the, it, your your point about maybe it will never be enough. Another way to look at it is, okay, let's just go to everybody uh, who's transgender can uh, can compete in women's sports as a small example. And once that's the settled status sure. quo, that must be torn down right. because the status quo is the status quo, and by definition. Any status quo must be torn down. That's why, to me, this is, first of all, un unending, unwinnable, non-compromisable, and frank nihilism. Uh, and I don't know if there is a society that was ever built on nihilism. My guess is no. Uh, certainly not a successful one. It's not even something that you read about in books. Uh, this is beyond science fiction. This is beyond... Uh, Anything like a 1984 world or Brave New World or Kafka's The Trial, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of absurd logic of the Mad Hatter Tea Party kind of circular argument uh, is what this reminds you of, which, of course, there is no out to a circular argument. So it's, it's very frightening. I think what's most frightening is that uh, if you're passive, this is my belief. And maybe I'll I'll stop with this. Uh, if you just think things go away, I think this is why we had and still have the problems with the loss of civil liberties from the pandemic that are going to continue. This is not over. Uh, there is a tremendous uh, passivity in people that is a dangerous passivity to simply sit and think things will go away. There's a danger to a, a, a tremendous void in courage in, in the United States, perhaps in the world, but I'm just speaking as an American because I'm shocked at the acquiescence of people, at the fear of people in leadership positions on university campuses, including my own Stanford University, uh, some of the weakest leadership I, I, I could have imagined uh, we've all experienced. And I'm, I'm very concerned because one of the fundamental parts of America that we all thought, maybe naively, 
was not going to be susceptible to this stuff was private business, private enterprise, because it too it is a bottom line uh, sort of construct, uh, profit uh, and free market type uh, you know construction. That's that's disappearing. Uh, on the other hand, the shred of hope is we do see people reacting. Right, we do see people reacting to what's being uh, in in a very crudely way shoved down their throat, whether it's the beer uh, or any of these other things going on in the news. So, I mean, that's the hope is that, but part of this is, you know, I, I feel the solution to wokeism is having the real wokeism. People have to awaken to what is happening with wokeism. And I'm not, I'm not just saying that to make a pun. I think people are sitting there uh, convincing themselves that this is not a very serious threat to all freedom uh, that has been built in this country that we want, not just for ourselves, for our children. What kind of a country uh, are we, are we uh, enabling here if you don't have people have the, have the guts to stand up against it? Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you finish, Todd. Uh, you you give me your final that, word. Here. That's exactly where I was headed here, Scott. Which is, um, you said passive, but what this does, it puts people like us in a very difficult position because we believe. Well, a lot of people on our side continue to believe. I think somewhat naively that these people still believe in the same things we believe in. That they believe in truth. That they believe in merit, uh, um, and we just they believe in evidence. And if we can just explain it to them better, we can change their minds. They are not playing the same game we are playing, right? They are not playing in universities, for example. We could call it this shared search for truth game, uh, where we've had certain rules set. They are playing a power game, and they believe they are entitled to play a power game because they believe that's the way the world is operates, and so. We need to come to grips with the fact that they are willing to use any means at their disposal against us uh, to, to, to achieve their goals, that they are willing to use power. They are willing to change any rule if they think it's um, what they need to do in order to, uh, to, to accomplish their goals. And we need to come to grips with that, which is, um, I mean, one word might be passive, but one word might just be realistic. Uh, which is to say, uh, um, what do we, you know, what are we willing to do recognizing that they're willing to do anything? Um, because they are willing to do anything. They are willing to destroy any institution, any rule, break any norm, if they think it will advance their, uh, their role. And that's, you know, what we're experiencing right now. Well, I hate to end on a sort of a fear note, but uh, this is the reality. It, it's a fascinating topic. And I'm going to have you back, Todd, if, if you can do it, uh, because a lot of this stuff is sort of complicated and we need to get a, we need to get a good handle on it. And particularly looking forward to working out how to articulate this in a very clear way with some solutions. So uh, thanks again for joining. Thank you for listening to Independent Truth with Scott Atlas. If you want to find out more about today's guest, Professor Todd Zwicky, check out his website as well as his Twitter account. And don't forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, anywhere else you're listening to podcasts right now. And I'll see you next time.